Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this panel. I'm very excited to be your moderator. I'm Margaret Anderson, and I am a managing director at Deloitte Consulting. Uh, previously led Faster Cures, and am thrilled to still be involved with them on the board. So we have an amazing group of panelists uh, that will be sharing their their experiences, their insights into this journey of where we are with cancer today, where we've been. Uh, and I hope that at the end, we're gonna have time left over for questions. So please, you know, sort of aggregate your thoughts and, and get ready for the uh, Q&A period. So, you know, I'm not gonna go over, um, you know, sort of big bios for each person. If you could, as we start the conversation, share a little bit about, you know, your vantage point into this, uh, that would be terrific. So I wanted to start with um, a quote. So I was thinking about a book that I read that I hope many of you have read as well uh, that Sid Mukherjee wrote called The Emperor of All Maladies. Uh, I believe it was also made into a, a documentary. So a quote from that book, he says, in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, the Red Queen tells Alice that the world keeps shifting so quickly under her feet that she has to keep running just to keep her position. This is our predicament with cancer. We are forced to keep running merely to keep still. So my opening question to each panelist is, are we in a better place than perhaps this quote reflects? Are we in an optimistic place? And I will begin, Greg, with you. Sure. Uh, cancer has some unique challenges. It feels like every time we open a door, uh, there's a whole new set of rooms uh, to explore. But I can't think of a better time than today where we have the tools to, to understand the biology we're looking at and think about how to address it. Uh, the challenge becomes, with this complexity, we always have to take our pulse and see where we are. Now, I'm an oncologist by background, so my background's more on the, the treatment side. And what I've seen over the past real 10 years is a shift towards personalization of medicine. I think what we used to call cancer was a bin of many, many different diseases. But with these new tools, we've begun to dissect it down to smaller and smaller subsets. Um, that's not to say we have all the answers, but we have more answers. And that theme of personalization, trying to deconvolute the complex into something that's a bit more simple, uh, I do think that there's lessons to be learned there that can be applied to other diseases as well. Um, whether it's lupus or Alzheimer's, this idea that we can fingerprint an individual patient's disease, understand what's going on, and then monitor them over time to see how it changes. That's a theme that only is going to become more profound as time goes on. So I asked permission from my panelists if I could uh, address them each by their first name versus doctor. I'm the only non-doctor on the panel, so uh, I don't want you to think I'm being informal with our panelists. Um, Doug Lowy, could you talk about it from the perspective of the institute that you lead, the National Cancer Institute? Are we, um, you know, sort of still looking through the looking glass? Are we on unstable footing? You've spent your career uh, studying this. Yes, well, thanks very much, Margaret, and thanks to all of you for uh, coming here. Uh, first, we need to recognize that many too many people are still dying from cancer. 600,000 people a year in the United States on the other hand, there are even many more people who get cancer, about 1.6 million per year. So uh, in terms of curing people, a lot of people are already being cured. But I would think that uh, Dr. Mukherjee would probably agree now that we are making substantial strides in advances, both as in prevention and early detection as well as in treatment. Let me just give you one salient example. Four years ago, uh, the, uh, melanoma uh, mortality rates in the United States had, were unchanged over the previous 10 years as they had been before. Fast forward four years to today, melanoma mortality rates are going f down faster than any other cancer type. And the melanoma experience now is being replicated in other cancers, is that correct? Yes, and this is really thanks to a lot of basic research. Cancer research has been extremely fortunate in having a lot of outstanding researchers who over time have made a lot of discoveries so that we understand much more about the basic 
framework of cancer, but translating that understanding into clinical advances takes time. And fortunately for us, there has been a continual pipeline uh, for a number of years, and so we have over the last few years seen a progressive decrease in the uh, incidence and mortality from cancer, and, that in, and that, those decreases are attributable to prevention, screening, and treatment. So your budget at NCI, at the National Cancer Institute, is five, five billion, you know, 5.75, is that right? So, yes. So how much of that goes towards this basic science that you're referring to? Well, we uh, figured that about half of the uh, support goes for, base, uh, goes for basic research. The NCI, although it is a large organization, we think of ourselves to the extent possible being a bottom-up organization rather than a top-down organization. For late-phase clinical trials, of course, we need to have them organized, but the uh, candidate treatments, et cetera, that are, deter that are decided upon for the uh, cooperative groups are really decided by them what they are going to be. Uh, so we really rely on our investigators. And uh, interestingly, for the last two years, the Nobel Prize has been awarded for researchers who are involved in cancer research, although some of them have been involved in other things, as well as the research going beyond cancer. But this, and the Nobel Prizes that were awarded have both basic aspects, opening up fields, as well as leading to translational applications and clinical benefit. So, Fuad, could you tell us a little bit from your perspective, um, you know, maybe adding on to some of the things that Greg was talking about, what, what's your vantage point right now on cancer science, discovery, innovation? Um, two patients, actually, uh, each time I, I, I answer this type of question, I, I think about a patient who was a very good friend of mine who passed away back in the late 90s of a metastatic melanoma because the treatment he was offered was chemotherapy. And this was not that far in, in back in, in time. Today, uh, we know, even in advanced melanoma, more than 50% of patients are alive, alive at five years, and I really think that's a major advance. And, and the other patients I, I, I think about is a patient who was in one of our very first phase ones uh, on anti-PD-1 agent immunotherapy. Um, this is a lung cancer patient who was sent to hospice in actually and, and went to, to Johns Hopkins, not far from here, and was treated. And he comes and visits us at Bristol Marsh with every single year, and we are in 2019, so 10 years now, unheard of thinking about patients who can live with late stage lung cancer with this amount of, of, of follow up. On the other hand, I don't think, I think this is the tip of the iceberg. I think our job is not done because I'm talking about all the other patients that we cannot help. I'm talking about the other 50% of patients who still do not make it to um, 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 five year survival when they have a metastatic melanoma. But I think, um, I think there is hope and there is a proof of confidence that we have been able to make it for this number of patients. We have to believe in continuing to push in the science the way we have been doing, not only as an industry, but mostly as partners with, you know, and the academic world, the um, um, supportive organization for, for, for research. And I'm, I'm confident that, um, I don't know in how many years, we probably start seeing even more advance in, in transforming breakthrough discoveries into transformational medicine, and I, I, I do believe that. Excellent. Ellen Siegel, uh, head of Friends of Cancer Research, another group that I'm on the board of and proud to be a member of that um, contingent. Ellen, you're a force to be reckoned with. How, how are you orienting yourself to you know, what this quote says? We are forced to keep running merely to keep still. Do you feel like you're running a little less hard now than when you started? No, harder, no harder. I mean, first of all, thank you for being here and thank you, Margaret, for all of you for your amazing contributions. I mean, there's and amazingly good news. I mean, the, when we started the war on cancer, we thought of one disease uh, and, and the funding of the National Cancer Institute and the infrastructure that we have and the scientific commitment and the knowledge has been extraordinary and we have re enormous re rewards. But we can't forget that patients are still dying. Uh, we have curative therapies now that are 
very exciting, but you know they're still hard to access. They're expensive, and they're only for a very small number of patients. We immunotherapy has enormous promise, but also some disappointments that we have to work on, and we have to go faster. But we have to be smart. You know, we have to get the get treatments to patients that actually work. And there are a lot of diseases we can screen or prevent, or we certainly know about a lot of environmental factors, tobacco, but there are some diseases, you know, brain tumors and certain forms of breast cancer and certainly blood cancers, we don't have a clue. So we have a long way to go and we can't forget those patients that are being diagnosed today without a lot of promising treatments. But we have gone a long way and we are getting it together in a way and the science is amazing and I'm thankful for those every day that are working on this so we are but we have to run fast and smart so Nick can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're driving uh, at the Broad count me in uh, you engage very closely with patients and what is their response to the work that you're leading and and you know what drives them thanks well first thanks thanks for, for having uh, me and thanks for, for attending um, I share the, the optimism of, of my co-panelists about cancer, but I also agree that, that um, there's an urgency, right? As a medical oncologist and someone who studies cancer and works with, a lot with patients, you know, there are lots of people who don't have good therapies or develop resistance to therapies, um, and, and we feel that urgency every day. And so the idea behind Count Me In was that the vast majority of cancer patients in the United States might be interested in contributing to research and sharing their own information or sharing their own biospecimens, their tumor samples or their blood samples or their saliva samples, but the vast majority of patients in the U.S. are treated at community centers, not at the large academic centers that might do this type of research. And so their data is sitting in their local oncologist's office. Their tumors might be in their local pathology department. And although many people think that all of their samples are being studied by researchers, the fact is that most studies, most samples aren't studied because no one's ever asked those patients if they'd be willing or interested in contributing them. So the idea behind Count Me In, which is a research initiative that we started out of the Broad Institute and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute along with the Emerson Collective a few years ago, is um, to use social media and patients and patient advocates um, and enlist them to share their information and their samples with researchers and with the Count Me In proje projects, and in return, the Count Me In projects will take all that data and will make it publicly available. And there's been really, we've now launched five projects over the last few years. We started in metastatic breast cancer. Um, we then launched projects in a rare sarcoma called angiosarcoma. We now have a project in metastatic prostate cancer, in stomach and esophageal cancer, in brain cancers, and our sixth project in osteosarcoma, which is also a pediatric cancer, um, is about to be launched. And across those projects, we've had tremendous enthusiasm from the patient community who want to be part of the process. They want to be part of the solution. Many of them are doing this for altruistic reasons. If they can't help themselves, at least they want their information and their samples to be able to help the next person and help others. So, so I think I am optimistic, but I, I think this idea of researcher, physician, patient partnerships to accelerate this process is really going uh, to um, take the knowledge that we've generated so far and really supercharge it. So I want to follow up on a point that you raised around patients wanting to engage and, and be part of the solution. Um, I want to ask everyone in the audience to raise your hand if you yourself are a cancer patient or survivor, if you have a family member who is a cancer patient survivor or has passed away, close friend, you know, people in your lives. I would doubt that many of us you know, have our hand down. I think the, the points you're raising are, are important. I want the panel to reflect on this with me. Um, are we prioritizing patients in this fight, in this enterprise? Are we um, thinking enough about the struggles that they have actually managing treatment, enduring treatment? And if we are not, what should we be doing differently? Take a crack at that. Sure. So the answer is, I don't think anybody working in this field is not trying to prioritize patients. Yeah. I mean, but in some ways we're not. I mean, we accepted enormous toxicities. You know, we were treating patients and are still treating patients and trying to get them some more time, but the quality of life and what they have to deal with, the accessibility, the affordability, trying to bring 
then what they want is complex because everybody wants more time and everyone wants cures and everyone wants quality of time, but often the patients are suffering and they're also complex. If you're gonna treat, be treated in a community or you're gonna get on a clinical trial or the exclusionary criteria are gonna work with you, or if you're gonna go to Johns Hopkins or you're gonna be offered something that's right for you rather than at um, of George Washington or Georgetown, so it's very confusing for patients. So I think everybody wants to do it, mm -hmm. but now as we get into precision me um, medicine and rare diseases where the patient population is really small, how are we gonna find those patients and what trials are they gonna go on? Because everyone is doing it on a one-off and we're not gonna get to that, so that is a problem. I mean, so again, the goal is absolutely right, and I don't think anybody in this room or in this field isn't thinking about it, but the complexity of where we're going and for patients making these choices is, is very hard. Who else? Uh, I was just going to um, follow by saying I, 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 I completely agree with Ellen. I think one of the challenges we face is that we do not work together enough. And, um, um, it, 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 you know, we're talking about quality of life, we're talking about duration of therapies, do we need to treat patients for two years, maybe one year is enough, maybe six months is enough. Uh, do, you, uh, do, do we want to you know, follow uh, survivorship and learn from patients who survive, but also learn from patients who unfortunately saw, her, saw their disease progressing? Um, and it's not really one entity, whether it's a company A or B, or it's the NIH, or it's you know, an organization like Friends of Cancer Research and the Broad Institute, but it's, it's all of us. And I think we have, such, um, we, ha we have accumulated over time such amount of data and information that I really believe it's time to find the right platforms and the right venues to start you know, defining what are the next challenges for the, ne what are the, challenges for the next years. Um, what do we want to tackle together? And, and I really think we have the opportunity to do this. And we have, I, I give Ellen as an example, organizations that have been excellent in facilitating this kind of multi-partnership effort to, to ask these big questions and answer them. So, Margaret, let me yes. <coughs> suggest three possible uh, ways of intervening that might be even better than what we do now. One is at the patient level, to give more emphasis to so-called patient-reported outcomes, uh, symptomatic relief, and we're supporting uh, research in this area to try to uh, bring that more front and center and to help people so that they can, uh, their quality of life will be better during the time that they have cancer. Uh, a second important uh, aspect, I think, is developing the evidence so that the complicated aspects of cancer treatment can be assisted by people who need it with patient navigators. Uh, being able to have this as a reimbursable uh, part of cancer treatment I think could be very helpful, but we need to be sure that the evidence for its improvement uh, is there. And then finally, I think the technological uh, in, uh, involvement, which is to the extent possible to try to bring cancer treatment to the patient rather than the patient to cancer treatment. For example, wearable devices, et cetera. The, if, if we're going to have an impact, uh, as, as, uh, w as Nick was mentioning, particularly in rural areas, having wearable devices and other kinds of uh, resources on site where you are could probably have a, a great deal of impact, not just on care, but also on comfort. One of the questions I think you posed to us um, before we stepped on the stage was, what does good look like when it comes to drug development? And uh, as I reflect on the past 10 years, there are a couple of hard trends that really, I think, are going to teach us about how we need to apply drugs in the future for the patients. The bar has been raised, uh, the mention of melanoma is a good example. As drug developers, we're no longer looking for small effect sizes, just delaying progression, particularly if patients are suffering. We're thinking about are there patients who, if they're gonna commit their time, energy, and resources to a therapy, are they cured at the end of the day? The bar has been lifted there. And so the tactical implications, I think as a field that we're going to have to address to, again, get at what the patients really want are to not think about treating the most advanced patients, but rapidly moving up into either the secondary prevention, once someone's had a tumor, to try to keep it from coming back, 
or some of the work Dr. Lowy's done, the primary pre prevention field, this is where we're gonna have to take many of the tools that we have today, and it's hard work. It's not easy to prove in those earlier stages that drugs are helping patients. But if you actually sit down and talk to the patients, that's what they want. They, they don't wanna be a cancer patient for the rest of their life. They wanna go through a certain treatment and then go off and live their life. Um, I think we all will aspire to, to bringing those kind of therapies forward. Did you want to comment on that in terms of putting the patient at the center? It, you're, it's at the essence of what you're driving. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Okay. So that was a theme when we were having our panel prep discussions around something, Fouad, that you brought up, this um, how are we collaborating, what are the barriers to collaboration? Um, so I would love it if you could think about the, what we're generating in terms of data and the access now that we have to data and the you know, more sophisticated tools um, you know, cloud storage, et cetera, and how that may help provide some relief for the collaboration struggles that you talked about, but also what are the barriers that are still in place? Um, yeah. Would you like to speak on that from the NCI vantage point in terms of how you're sort of looking at data aggregation and then what are the tools that we need to actually mine that? Well, I think that everyone talks about data sharing but data sharing has different uh, interpretations, shall we say, for different people. <clears throat> we have a uh, proposed White House initiative on pediatric cancer research, which is going to be a data-driven uh, initiative. And we're trying essentially to use uh, pediatric cancer to help all children who develop cancer, but also, if you will, as an important study of how to really do data sharing. Pediatric cancer, fortunately, is only 1% of all the cancer in the United States. But we think that we can take advantage of that small number and the relatively small number of databases that currently are not interoperable to the degree that we would like and uh, through a variety of measures trying to help to make that a reality. One of the interesting things uh, that uh, cancer advocates have talked about that sounds very reasonable to me is that the, uh, the data belonging to the patient and the investigators are the stewards of that data. And Nick may uh, comment on that perhaps even uh, more articulately than I can. I, I think that's a, a great way to say it, which is you know, patients uh, do own their data and patients are uniquely able to share their data in many cases. Um, when in the old model, and I would say data sharing in the academic spheres is already changing. Uh, you know, the, the, the days of academic institutions hoarding their data, th that is still true to some extent, but it, it, data has become much more open and academic institutions are much more willing to share and collaborate than they used to be. So there is a trend towards data sharing, but really the, the big transformative change, I think, is this idea of patients um, uh, being able to own and share their data and then researchers being the stewards and that really is the underlying principle behind Count Me In and there are other other initiatives like that which empower patients to to take their data, share it, put it out in the world, share it with who they want to share it um, and, and I think that is uh, that will be a key to aggregating sufficient data to be able to make some of these discoveries in rare subgroups or um, particular um, individuals that respond or don't respond to a therapy in whom you need to aggregate data to be able to see a pattern. So, it, so, so I want to say this is aspirational and wonderful and we're all thinking about it, but it's messy and it doesn't really happen that way in, re in the real world. First of all, most patients... What, tell us what happens. Well, first of all, 85% of our patients are not treated on a clinical trial. They're in a community setting. Their records, their EHRs are, are, are a mess. And to, to get something that really is meaningful, even if they're willing to share it, so it you, it gives you a, a roadmap is is complicated. The diagnostic, the wearables, are great, but they're messy too. And you know, is the data right? You know, the diagnostics that really will determine whether a patient gets treatment, that's also messy. You know, you know, clear versus you know, particularly if it's going to be um, treatment it's going to indicate which treatment a patient has that has to be accurate. So the goal is right, the data is really important, but we see even in the work that we're doing at Friends, even the work that we're doing on TMB and CTDNA, the data is different. We're getting people to share da data, but the data is different from every institution. And having some 
clear playing field where you understand that data so it's meaningful is really going to be important because if, if it's going to determine treatment, it has to be accurate. Well, I want to, I want to dig into this because, Ellen, you're talking about this, um, you know, the aspiration and also sort of the messiness that we current live in, currently live in. Um, Doug, you were talking about it from the standpoint of the pediatric use case, if you will, the, you know, this place that you can kind of dive in. But you, I was struck when you were describing that, that you said there are these data sets that are not already talking to each other. And yet, I think we can all agree there's probably no more compelling issue out there than pediatric cancer. So why, first of all, why is it messy? You gave us some of those reasons, Ellen, but why are we not doing better by all of the people that you know, we're representing when we raise our hand? And I'm not trying to just put you guys in hot seats. I promised I wouldn't do that. But I think we all share the same passion for change, you know, moving this forward. And I'm looking at Esther uh, from Faster Cures. You know, Faster Cures is looking at this from a metric standpoint um, in the oncology space, but using oncology as a vantage point to look at other disease systems. So we know there are other panels going on right now in neuroscience. They are, you know, going to be struggling with the exact same things that we are. So. I, I, I think one of the um, one of the challenges, and we talk about sharing data, and you know, not a lot of things have happened over um, over the last, let's say, couple of decades. Um, I, I agree. I think it needs, it, it's messy. Uh, platforms do not communicate, and technology will improve that. But there is one thing that I I, I know, with Margaret, over time, it only works when there is a specific project or a big question that we need to tackle as partners in this field. Um, if it's just sharing and putting data in databases without a driver or specific a project that will really help patients answer major questions, it takes time and it doesn't work. As an example, you, today we are facing a major and raising issue of resistance to immunotherapy. You know, our patients were treated for a couple of years and then or a year or less and, and, and then they progress and that's not good. And the way we are defining this resistance to, um, to this new therapies of cancer is different. When you are a patient, you don't want um, that your doctor is telling you according to company A drug, you are resistant and according to company B drug, you are not resistant. There was a very nice initiative that many of us contributed to by the uh, Society um, um, of Immunotherapy of Cancer, SITSI, under the leadership of Mario Schnall from Yale, where people came together, industry, um, or cancer organizations, uh, regulators, to try to define based on data that we have in our databases as an industry and as academic institutions to define something specific and said, let's publish this, let's agree this is the way we are talking about this specific thing. It may sound like a very small step, but I really think it's a big advance that we are all in speaking the same, all speaking the same words when it comes to this specific topic. I think friends, um, um, cancer research are leading similar effort in ctDNA and defining what amount of you know tumor circulating DNA in the blood we should look at to predict whether or not this medicine works and many other questions so but I think it has to be specific and I think step by step brick by brick I think we're going to build something bigger but just sharing overall to share in my view will not I, take I us think wrong. That's an important point. There's consortia fatigue also, and there's a lot of collaboration, but there has to be a reason for it. You have to have an end goal, and there has to be something that individual groups can't do on their own. And I know uh, NCI did the match and, and you had, you, you worked really hard to make sure that the data that you're getting from these uh, genetic data was all, there was concordance. So those are really important um, efforts. What I like about what I'm hearing, though, is there's the technical aspects and the scientific aspects where you know, we've seen this uh, sort of majestic you know, evolution of the science and we're seeing benefits for patients. Um, and we're seeing technical you know, sort of advancements in terms of data sharing and what's possible. But then there's this human aspect and this kind of almost sociology, psychology aspect of what you're bringing up is just having it there for the sake of having it there doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, let me get your perspective on that from NCI and how are you, you know, you're, you're funding a lot of this early stage work. What, how, well, how do you enter into this? Well, Morgan, first, I don't think that people should come away thinking that there is no sharing, okay? If that's out here, 
and perhaps where we want to be is here, we're in the middle. Okay. Uh, there, but it's not, a, even with people being a like-minded and wanting to do it, there are some barriers. Uh, for example, legal barriers, ethical barriers. What is the informed consent that, uh, uh, by which people have signed in a particular database? Does it permit interoperability? Uh, privacy issues. For example, in pediatric cancer, uh, knowing what the germline configuration is of the patient is important. For example, in, the, in our pediatric match trial, in contrast to the adult match trial, we do germline analysis of DNA in addition to uh, looking at the cancer. And so a question is, if you know the germline of a child with cancer, might it be impossible to keep his or her privacy or that family uh, privacy together. I mean, there are just a number of a number of different issues. These are not impo impossible barriers to overcome, but each one needs to be dealt with in a thoughtful way. But I come back to the notion that if we are all trying to share a goal of getting to here, then it becomes possible not in a day but with systematic uh, approaches to get to the point we want to be. So one of the themes that came up again when we were discussing this panel was, um, are we going too fast? And Ellen, you brought up a critique that you've heard that uh, we're pushing too hard, going too fast. Uh, you know, Greg, I'll give you a, a moment to re respond to that. Do you think that we're going too quickly? Well, the patients don't think we're going too quickly, right? Uh, just to bring it back to, to what this is all about. Um, and, and so from that standpoint, um, I'm sure many of my fellow panelists feel this obligation that we need to move as quickly as we can for the good of, of that end game. The challenge, of course, is it's messy. And we all represent different institutions in a very complex uh, web uh, that is academic, industry, uh, government research. How do we get those groups to work together in all for lack of a better term, row in the same direction. I think there are some examples of where the incentives can be aligned, and there's some great work you know, being done, uh, certainly by Friends of Cancer Research, the FNIH, trying to have the right forums to allow that speedy train, again, to have a direction. But as Fouad nicely pointed out, we do need to ground ourselves in specific projects. That's just the nature of what we do. And if we can find those common, common areas, I don't think we're moving too fast, and I think then the issue just becomes, you know, taking that momentum and driving it in, 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 a, in the right direction. And the reason I raise that is, uh, you know, for being provocative, because I, I found it sort of astounding, uh, because all of us would agree that patients need it right now, uh, and if we're not a patient now, we probably will be at some point. Um, Ellen, what's your experience with that? critique. Is that more on the regulatory side? It, it's really more on the regulatory side. There are a lot of critics, particularly academic critics, that are saying we need, you know, and but picked up by the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, you know, we're going too quickly. We don't have overall survival. You know, they don't like breakthrough. Well, you know, in the field of precision medicine, we have rare disease. If, if patients are not going to wait 15 years if they have a specific tumor that is actionable by a drug. I mean, so it's ridiculous even to even have these arguments. What patients want are drugs that work, treatments that work, and the most likely treatment, particularly in unmet medical needs. So no patient who has a rare disease or, or where there isn't any treatment is going to say, I'm, I'm willing to wait 20 years where they're not going to be alive. But on the other hand, they want a, a treatments that are likely to work for them or have some evidence. So the issue is the regulatory environment is the standards haven't changed. It still has to be safety and efficacy. So I think these critics that are talking about too fast don't have, don't understand the needs of patients, or don't understand where the science is going. We are not, we're not in big organ site diseases. We're in rare diseases with very small populations, and to get those patients and to get them something that's likely is going to take some time, but it's also going to take focus, and it has to be fast. But there has to be a standard. And I think that underscores what we're talking about with data sharing and getting large groups of patients to share and getting institutions to share their data because if we need to move fast and we want to have solutions for people with 
rare disorders, and we don't want to sacrifice our uh, principles of safety, uh, then one solution is you know, have more data so that we're more confident about the treatments we're choosing and developing. And, and so that circles back to, to what we're talking about to begin with. So in the spirit of thinking outside in, um, I would love the panel to think about, are there disciplines or uh, methods from other fields or other disease areas that you think need to be brought into oncology? I'm wondering, Ellen, you have a background in construction and oh some God. family interest. I mean, you know, I mean, is this a giant construction project? Do we have enough engineers at the table? <laughs> I thought you were going to talk about my Russian history background, not construction. I was a developer. I was and in you were finance, an aspiring but, ballerina. I know yes, a lot about yeah, my but, panelists. But, yeah, but, but uh, yeah, it's an integration issue. There's no question about it. I think we're getting better at it. Um, but there is, I mean, we're bringing in mathematicians, statisticians, you know, so the field has to be integrated because today to go quickly, you really have to get the data and sorting out, you know, these electronic health records and getting to something that is meaningful for patients. Even the data that we have at the FDA on claims data and the PCORI data on EHR, just trying to figure out how you can do smarter trials. You can use real world evidence, synthetic trials is going to take some time and some data analytical um, uh, um, fields, but, but, but I think we're doing that. I think that everyone recognizes that it's not just the basic biologist, it's really the statistician, it's the chemist, it's the integration of math and science and data that will get us there. So um, I don't know of other diseases because the science is so good in cancer and we're not there in some other diseases. Yeah. I think one, one, one of the things I would add is um, the way we do drug development and the research has, has been consistent for a long period of time. So, and, and we need to shorten the timelines of this. So, we always, you know, look at animal models, we use the mice and other things, and then we go to the human, and then you see researchers in the preclinical world tell you, well, the mouse models are not very predictable of what you're gonna see in the clinic, so you only know when you do the clinical experiment. And I believe in the world we, we, we live in today with, with, with I mean, I understand, we all understand biological systems are very complex and cannot be solved, resolved with one mathematical equation. It's very complex, but in the world we live in today with all the algorithm and the artificial intelligence, can we improve our predictability to move from one of 10 drugs work to maybe five of, one, of, one out of two and, and, and then do not involve a lot of patients like we do today, thousands and thousands of patients, sometimes you don't get an answer actually. And, and then try to be more efficient and actually more patient friendly by using more technologies because we are um, you know, still using the same things we use, the same tools we used decades ago. Are companies, do you think, um, sort of opening up their aperture to include some of the, you know, the things that you talked about? And is some of that just waiting for the regulatory paradigm to catch up? I think it's 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 a a, 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 a a growing knowledge and and interest of companies. Yes, companies are interested in including machine learning and including new technologies, a new way of thinking to really accelerate the knowledge and try to better develop medicines. Are we there yet? The answer is no. It's mm -hmm. just the beginning of it. And and even before the regulatory process, we're trying to figure out how could that work to allow us to better predict. I think everybody in the industry is investing, you see, you know, press releases here and there on a very frequent basis, but we have not seen yet the outcome of that. It's probably gonna take a few years to start seeing things, you know, helping improving the prediction and therefore using less patient or exposing less patient to toxic agents. But I, 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 I would not be surprised that we will start seeing something in the next years. I don't know, Greg, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, just to be, there's so many ways one could answer this question. Um, just focusing a little bit on this idea of, of preclinical data, uh, you know, we as, as um, you know, Sherpas of, of, of drugs, trying to get them through to patients, understanding what they are, um, we often look to the preclinical data sets to try to guide us, but, but it's like there's a, a hazy windshield in front of us. Um, we're not even talking about the reproducibility crisis that's going on uh, in the preclinical literature right now. And, and yet, uh, there's, uh, it's difficult to see how, in such a complex uh, environment, we're going to sort through this. I, I do think that, again, uh, transparency, publication, 
perhaps there's a missing piece here as well where uh, there, some sort of exchange where data can be shared uh, in the preclinical space, mm -hmm. not even patient data, but this preclinical data. So experiments don't necessarily get repeated that have already been done, and mistakes don't necessarily get made when, when there, there, there's a volume there. I, we have reagents that we can, we can share, uh, we have knowledge that we can share, and I think as a field, uh, the grand we need to be better at trying to build on that knowledge rather than always staying in, in our silos reproducing uh, individual data points. Doug, how is NCI driving um, this issue of looking ahead at uh, new technologies, new disciplines, new ways of thinking? How are you infusing that back into the you know, strategic plan, if you will, of NCI and what you're funding and, and directing? So I would say that there really are at least three different ways in which we try to do this. First, we try hard not to compete with the pharmaceutical industry in developing products because we feel that if they're already doing it, that's what they do for a living, and we try to complement what they are doing. And we complement that in at least two different ways. One is that we work with them to perhaps uh, underpin the mechanistic understanding with clinical trials so that the, the drug companies under, you know, appropriately are most interested in knowing, does this work? But we feel that by understanding why it works for this group of patients but not for that group of patients is going to, that mechanistic understanding will lead to further advances so that we can improve outcomes for more people. And so that's one way in which we interdigitate. Another way that we complement is that we have our own, if you will, translational pipeline where we work on targets that are deemed at the moment to be too difficult, mm -hmm. too complicated for the pharmaceutical industry to go after. And part of that is to develop those, but also to some degree to de-risk the uh, investment in these hard to target, uh, uh, hard to develop targets for uh, interventions for. Uh, and so that's uh, you know, a, a, very imp a very important area. I also want to mention that we would like to learn from uh, HIV treatment, where HIV treatment is combination treatment developed for rational understanding of how the different inhibitors work. We are just learning the rules of the road, and that's what we're trying to invest in, with what happens with targeted therapy, that is, these small molecule inhibitors, what is happening with uh, immunological therapy, and how might they interdigitate one with the other, and so we're supporting that. So, is so it isn't that part of the problem, though, because in immunotherapy, everybody knows combinations, and there are so many trials. How does a patient or an investigator know which one is the right one of the combinations? That's why these basket trials or these, you know, c collaborations like lung map are essential, particularly in rare diseases, because there are so many questions, and the answers are very few. And if we're going to take patient resources and they're that are going to be rare, how are we going to get there? So, um, Ellen. I agree with you, and what one of the things that we're trying to do is to have a better understanding of the rules of the road. Uh, really, a, a, as uh, Fraud was talking about, to have predictive oncology. We have a pilot program with the Department of Energy uh, trying to look at this issue to use their extraordinary computing powers and understanding of that to work in combination with us uh, and, and that's one way in which we're trying to uh, ad advance this area. But as has been said in a number of settings, still aspirational. So let me, uh, let me ask a follow-up question, though, on the HIV piece. So are you reflecting back on the, the journey of sort of discovery and drug discovery and treatment options in HIV and saying, how might that um, you know, be something that we look at in, in cancer? Margaret, I glo I glo I glossed over it. Mm -hmm. Basically, when HIV uh, inhibitors came out, there was single agent treatment. Yep. Resistance developed in a high percentage of patients. And it turned out that by putting combinations together, this was a way of greatly reducing the likelihood of developing resistance and thereby getting much longer term responses. 
And what has happened here, for example, uh, with single agent inhibitors, uh, say in, in, in melanoma, you can see dramatic responses to uh, inhibitors, say against uh, BRAF, one of, the one of the genes that's mutated frequently. But after a certain amount of time, resistance develops, and so uh, you, you know, the patient is back where he or she started uh, you know, several months earlier. And so the notion is by putting combinations together, you can decrease the likelihood of developing acquired resistance. And also by putting them together, we also would increase the, uh, the likelihood of developing something that would be effective the first time because there's primary resistance and there is acquired resistance. And both of these, the approaches of combination, I think hold a lot of promise. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I'd just say uh, one of our, our colleagues, a gentleman named T Tony Rivas, who's at UCLA, I think said it best um, when it comes to cancer. Uh, he quoted uh, the other day um, that he said, the tumor will outsmart, uh, outsmart your drug every time if you don't use biology to outsmart the tumor. And it's a simple way of saying, again, um, at least in the case of cancer, it's designed to push back on what we uh, throw at it. And with that regard, there's no substitute for the understanding of, of mechanism of action, mechanism of resistance, mechanism of sensitivity. And it's really the underpinning of everything moving forward in the face of oncology. If we leave that, we're, we're going to be goners. So also another quote from the Emperor of All Maladies. Um, he said, to confront cancer is to encounter a parallel species, one perhaps more adapted to survival than even we are. So it relates to what you're speaking about. Um, how do we stay one step ahead? And I'll ask the audience to start getting ready for questions. Well, I, so you, know, you asked a question earlier about the construction project. Um, and I do think there are elements of this that are you know, an engineering problem or a construction project. The data sharing piece in particular, it's an issue of scale. And you know, if we have enough resources, we can, we can share the data. But there's a whole other aspect of it, which, which we just heard about in the last two comments which is um, about basic understanding. And if we treat all of this as a construction project or an engineering problem, we're going to miss this underlying need for understanding biology. And, and so a lot of the you know, unexpected discoveries came from basic research, not from scaling up big engineering problems. And so, so I think that is key to, to, to outsmarting the, 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 the competing I think that's species. that's a really important point, because we're all really ready for answers and for things that are actionable for patients, but the basic science and the investment in basic science and the knowledge is what brought us here, and we have to be very careful, as anxious as we are, to get these answers in better trials for patients. If we don't invest in the basic science or keep this enterprise going with science, we're not going to get there, and we have to be really careful because there is a, ba and, and on the other hand, you have critics who, who say, we f should forget about any treatment. We have to go into basic prevention. Well, that's going to take a long time, and a lot of people are going to die if we do that. So we need a balanced portfolio. I, I agree more, Alan. I think because we, we, we face patients in a variety of ways, the urgency for us is a patient, and it should continue to be the patients. But I think the, 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 the investments in, in, in deepening our understanding of the biology, improving our models, the predictability of what we see in, in, in animal models or in the preclinical space in general um, needs to improve. And I think um, a lot of investments needs to be done by all the players in, in that space. It's, it's, it's the hidden face of um, drug development uh, for cancer in this case as an example. Doug, do you think that basic science um, gets enough respect? Do you think that we're, we're putting it in its vaulted place in terms of this, you know, sort of elegance of understanding of some of these things that let, we need to do all what so we're talking Margaret, about? Let me say that one of the real pleasures that I have had is testifying in Congress uh, for, uh, in front of our appropriations subcommittees. And uh, both in the House and the Senate, they simply assume that basic research is absolutely essential for making progress. The only question that I can remember in the last few years related to basic research was asking someone from another institute, which was, were they investing enough in basic research? And so this, I think that from the people who provide the resources uh, for us uh, really shows uh, their appreciation uh, of it. 
I, I would just add from an optimistic standpoint, yeah. um, you know, we can get weighed down by the daunting task ahead of us. But the good news is we're not alone. Nature's given us tools that many of our basic science researchers have learned to harness. I mean, all the discussion of the immunotherapy uh, that we've had up here is a great example of, again, harnessing this perfect tool that, that, that uh, evolution has placed in each and every one of our bodies. And, and it goes on and on, using viruses for gene therapy. Again, th there are tools out there, and I think the crosstalk of the different disciplines is just as important as the pure cancer research. That's where some of the greatest insights, I, I would predict, will come from in the future, things we're not thinking about today. I have to say, in the, in the conversations we had leading up to this panel, I was stunned with the um, innate optimism that you all shared. And you talked about that in terms of your, um, you know, sort of life's work, your career trajectory, the community that you're part of in terms of oncology, um, scientists, you know, physicians, clinicians. It was, it, it left me feeling very, um, you know, sort of positive about the future, not just because of the science that we're describing today, but really that we have this committed group of people who were driving forward. Uh, let me open it up to the audience for questions. I'm not sure if we have microphones, but if you want to stand up, identify yourself, ask your question. I know this isn't a shy group. I know many of you, so go ahead. start with it. I mean, look, um, drugs have to be affordable and accessible to patients. I don't think anybody on this panel would, would argue that. Uh, s there are some sensible solutions, uh, value-based models, and, and um, that we can look at, but we have to be very careful because we can't kill innovation. And, you know, and some of these models that are being proposed could be hurtful. Everybody knows that these treatments have to be accessible and more affordable, and it's a problem. But we have to look at the entire ecosystem on how to uh, get the benefit to patients. What patients don't want are cheap, ineffective drugs. What they want are accessible drugs that are affordable to them and accessible. So we have to get there, but and we have to acknowledge it's a big problem. But some solutions are sensible and some are not. Um. I, I, I agree. I think um, the most important thing um, is when you have transformational medicine, you want patients to have access to them. Otherwise, I mean, there is no point of developing uh, a medicine. I, I think um, it is an issue. It's a complex issue, and I think it has to be worked with multiple partners. The theme of this this panel is really how to make people work together to find solutions, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll probably get there. But the, the most important thing, I completely agree is to have patients have access to transformational medicines. Anyone else? I would just add that, you know, from a drug developer standpoint, I think the onus is on us to make sure that when we develop a therapy, again, that it reaches that transformational level. It reaches something, a, a bar that perhaps was higher in the past, and that often means subselecting patients. Again, understanding who it is that you're treating, trying to refine the group for those that, that could benefit most. And that's a, a very different approach. It takes thought, and, and of course, one has to uh, work their way towards that. Uh, but the idea that we'll have one therapy and you, you'll dilute out the effect across multiple patients, I think that's the wrong way to go. Luckily, this is the way that science is telling us is the right way to treat cancer, which is, again, follow the science, try to look for larger effect sizes. Uh, and the reality of that situation is there will be some drugs that, quote unquote, could work, but they're not gonna have the same value to society. And we just need to face that, that we, we need a drug that not only works, but works in someone who needs it, and then one that you can demonstrate that value. Yes. I know you. This is yeah, my colleague from Deloitte. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, and you asked me to ask a question, so I, uh, I really appreciate the uh, discussion around the importance of basic science, and uh, as a, my background is in mathematics and astrophysics, so, um, uh, in history, we've seen that scientific advances are made out of typically combination of incremental progress, uh, but then also some disruption in the field with completely new ideas. And so 
there has been a little bit of a critique in the biomedical field that because of the peer review process in terms of how funding is, is funding grants are reviewed and approved, uh, that there may not be sufficient diversity or radical new ideas that get funded uh, to advance the field. Is that, how, how would you see that? Do we have sufficient diversity or are we stuck in a rut and looking under the same, uh, you know, the proverbial light post for the key? Jurgen, I would say that uh, there is always room for improvement. We strive to uh, support uh, high risk, high payoff research. Uh, the vast majority of the research that is supported by the National Cancer Institute is actually derived from peer review through various uh, study sections, uh, et cetera, of extramural people judging uh, the applications of their, of their own peers. Uh, and we have different grant mechanisms that emphasize different degrees, if you will, of, uh, of risk. But we are always trying to look towards that and trying to help people understand that we are interested on the one hand in, in potentially risky but transformative ideas, but they shouldn't be just pipe dreams. You know, that there, there's, there should be some scientific basis, rationale, and logic to what is being proposed. Okay, time for one more. Well, two more. I feel like I've uh, discriminated against this side of the room, so we'll, we'll make it fast. Go ahead. Sure. Angie Wilson. I'm with Genentech and the Advocacy Relations Group. Um, the, a lot of conferences uh, talk about quality care in the community setting. 80% of our cancer patients are seen there. What specifically do you think needs to be done to improve quality in the community setting? Quality care. How do we improve it? Nick, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think there's a. I think there's a many things. Um, you know, quality. Uh, there's a large variation in quality of healthcare in general, particularly cancer care. And um, someone mentioned earlier access to not just drugs or cutting edge drugs, but also clinical trials uh, is a big um, is a big aspect. I think that people. Um, who aren't being seen at large academic medical centers are missing out on. And patients, you know, the 5% rate that we cite, less than 5% of adults in the U.S. are on clinical trials. A lot of that is because they don't have access to clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And so um, new strategies to be able to, you know, just like we're talking about in Count Me In, for example, um, allowing patients to share their data and contribute to cancer research wherever they live, there, there should be and could be a parallel approach to allowing patients to participate in cancer research through clinical trials wherever they live. And I know there are lots of ideas that people are working on to, to develop things yeah, like that. Well, Fran is a cancer researcher and ASCO worked on exclusionary criteria for clinical trials and really uh, HIV status. Certainly elderly are not offered and um, other things that were just real barriers. However, the issue is most patients are scared of them, they're not being offered, and the paperwork is just daunting. So getting into the community where patients live on sensible clinical trials that make sense for them, and which is a, also a caveat, is really important, because that's how we're gonna get real world data. Oh, go ahead. This is a multifactorial uh, question. Let me just give you two uh, partial answers. Uh, NCI has the uh, N NCI Community Oncology Research Program, which is present in most states in the United States. And one of the things that they do is to provide a high percentage of the patients who are actually going on NCI uh, clinical trials, but also on some pharmaceutical company trials. But the other thing that they do is cancer care delivery research in the community. Uh, a second part is to try to, uh, it, with the pediatric initiative, one of the things that we're hoping to develop is best practices for at least common pediatric cancers and to be able to disseminate that information so people who can't come to tertiary referral centers have a higher likelihood of being treated with the optimal care. So spreading the wealth. Go ahead. Yep. 
Hi, so Sebastian Hermelin, co-founder of the War on Cancer app, a social app for everyone affected by cancer. So I have a big question about the sort of the Achilles heel of cancer research when it comes to clinical trials. We know today that 60% of all clinical trials are non-performing sites. And when you dig into the numbers, you also realize that the biggest reason for this is not meeting recruitment criteria. Uh, we're basically building a match.com for patients and clinical trials for patients to easily find uh, clinical trials. So my question is, how do you foresee the future of finding patients or making patients find clinical trials instead of the other way around? Anyone want to take that? I, I can start. I, I think this is a very, very good point and, and question. I, I think we need to make more progress in terms of finding patients and matching you know, the clinical trials with the patient populations. A lot of the current um, technologies are becoming more and more helpful. We are seeing this in our experience. Uh, but, but also, we really need to be a little bit more realistic on when we are, what population of clinical trials we are looking for. And I would say if there is one thing we need to leverage more as clinical trial sponsor as an industry is using real world evidence and real world data to see what are the patients and what's happening in the real world and then match with how we design clinical trials. So I'm going to call a halt just because we've got a uh, time crunch and you can hear the din out there. Um, Nick, Ellen, Fouad, Doug, Greg, thank you for what you guys do. Uh, thank you all for what you're doing. Uh, I encourage you to come up and talk to the panelists and um, you know, help us kind of get to that future where we're joining forces, bringing down some of the collaboration barriers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.